Today we're talking with Pat Patius, CEO of Choice Hotels. Pat has the joy of running a hotel franchise company during a pandemic. Pat has seen a lot. This is a time from a naval officer to a longtime Choice executive. Because of this, he has great perspective on the small business owner. Let's hear what he has to say. Uh, Pat Patius, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, one of our fearless brand leaders in our industry. Tough time we're living in, but thank you for coming on. I appreciate your time. Great to be here, Teague. And uh, I've been watching these uh, these Teague talks. They're they're very informative. You get to learn a lot about people and, and where they're coming from. So I appreciate uh, you having me on. Oh, you were too kind. I appreciate it. But I got a lot of questions for you. So I'm excited. Uh, so I want to start, as I do with a lot of people, I want to find out who is Pat Patience and how did Pat Patience get into this fun industry? So I know a lot of the answers, but I'd like you to tell everybody. Tell me where you were born and raised, what school you went to, and how did you get into this industry? Sure. So I was uh, born here in Washington, D.C., um, which I know is uh, on the top of everybody's mind these days. Um, don't blame me. Um, but I did grow up around uh, a lot of the, <laughs> the political world. Uh, my, my parents and some of my family members have worked for the federal government. So uh, kind of in this political town, um, went to Duke University uh, on a Navy ROTC scholarship. Um, one thing I'm not sure a lot of people know is I'm one of 11 kids um, near the bottom. Uh, so by the time they got around to the ninth kid, they said, if you want to go to Duke, pay for it yourself. So I had to go get a scholarship from the Navy. But um, spent six years in the Navy uh, on a, a cruiser down in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, and then two years up at, here at the Pentagon. Um, and as part of that, I got an opportunity to work on the Chief of Naval Operations Strategy Team. And I said, boy, this is fun. How do you do this in the private sector? Um, and people said, well, you go get an MBA. Uh, so I went to Northwestern, uh, got an MBA. Um, and when I got out of Northwestern, I went to work for Arthur Anderson, which is no longer around, um, another life lesson. Um, but Arthur Anderson had, I think, five of the top six hotel companies as clients. Um, and certainly being in this town, Choice Hotels, Marriott, um, Hilton wasn't here yet, um, but we did work at IHG, we did work at uh, a number of the hotel industry uh, big players, and I spent a lot of time uh, doing projects at Choice Hotels, um, did about seven of them, I think, over the years. And in 2005, uh, the CFO at the time asked me if I wanted to come work for, for Choice. And uh, I love the industry. Uh, I love this business model, the franchise side of the house. Um, and I just love the people. So I said, sure. And that's 15 years ago. So I've been uh, here at Choice ever since uh, in sort of uh, rising roles along the way. Uh, but that's sort of my path of getting into the industry and so sort of how it all came together. What, what was your first role at Choice? So I started uh, running corporate development, um, which is, you know, sort of the M&A and how do you grow the business um, and corporate strategy, sort of what's the five-year plan for the company. Um, when Steve Joyce joined the company back in 08, um, he asked me to go out and run our IT organization, which is based in uh, Phoenix. Um, and so that was a that was a tough time. That was 2009, the last recession. Um, and I was flying back and forth from D.C. to Phoenix every other week, um, running that business. We have about 600 people out in our Phoenix office. That's where all our software engineers are, uh, and all of that. And so I, I used to say I had the sort of 10,000 foot level as a strategy guy, and the one bit level as the corporate uh, technology person. So great opportunity to kind of understand how everything works, top to bottom in a company like ours. So that was sort of what I added to my portfolio. And then over time, they started adding brands and marketing and development. And I was made COO uh, back in, I think, 2014 um, and uh, worked with Steve uh, that whole time and creating a lot of value, I think, for, for our company and for our franchisees. Um, and then became CEO in 2017. So that's uh, that's been sort of the, the rising set of uh, roles I've had in the company. I got to ask, what's it like following Steve Joyce? I mean, <laughs> he's one of the iconic personalities, if nothing else, in our industry. Yeah, I, I, I look, I learned a lot from Steve. Uh, Steve and I, if, if you know Steve and you know me, we're, we're sort of a bit of a polar opposites, but, but generally that makes great teams. Um, and, uh, you know, Steve obviously grew up in, in the industry, knew a ton of people uh, in the industry, still does. Um, and so uh, it was a good team, the two of us, a good dynamic duo of, you know, kind of, uh, you know, bringing together the sort of op side of the house and expertise that I have in technology, along with Steve and his development expertise and, and growth, you know, growth uh, 
uh, trajectory that, that, that he brought to our company. So um, that, that was a, a fun time. Uh, you know, the two of us dressed differently. Uh, if you know Steve's wardrobe, he did not leave that behind. Uh, when I became CEO, he took that with him. Um, but uh, no, great, great, great opportunity to learn from somebody who'd been in our industry a long time. Is there a reality? Is there a reality TV series in your future? <laughs> yeah, people always ask me if I'm going to follow Steve on the Undercover Boss, and I'm like, no, that that's not that's not in my uh, that's not in my future. Uh, I love it. That's all right. Head down, keep doing what you're doing. So, uh, one, I love the Naval Academy. Not a lot of those uh, Naval uh, officers. There's not a lot of those people in our industry. So unique. Good for you. Uh, do you see any combat? I should ask. No, I was in the Persian Gulf during the Iran-Iraq War. Um, and yeah, so this was 90, 1990, 1991, yep. um, time frame. And, uh, it was, uh, there were, you know, there were mines and, and, uh, it was, you know, you were at general quarters a lot. Uh, so it was a, it was a, it was a tough environment, but we, the United States were not at war when I was over there. Desert storm occurred not too long after that, the first, okay. first Gulf war. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was in some, uh, some interesting places, I think in, in the military and it, uh, uh, it's, uh, it really, it, it tries a lot of appreciation for people who do that for a living. Um, they're away from their families during the holidays. They are, they are out there protecting all of us. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's great to have been through that experience, um, and know what that's like, um, you know, cause it, it, it really, when people say, you know, we owe a lot to our service members, our servicemen and women, um, it's, uh, you, you, having lived it, you really understand what they, what they go through on a daily basis. Well, thank you for your service, I must say. So uh, tell me, let's dive in. What is it like running a global franchise company during a pandemic? I mean, Steve Joyce had it during the easy days. You've got it during the complicated ones. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, as, as we all know, this has been a challenge for everybody. I mean, nobody saw this coming. Uh, I remember at our key client event about a year ago, somebody saying, hey, you know, we're putting our budgets together. Um, you know, if the industry's due for a downturn, what do you think it'll look like? And I said, well, that, it'll never be as bad as it was in the Great Recession, right? <laughs> which, which was probably everybody's worst case scenario. Um, and yet here we are, you know, with an industry that, uh, you know, in the third quarter was down 49% in rep margin. Um, and uh, we've been lucky from the standpoint of the, the types of uh, the segments that we participate in uh, at Choice, you know, we were down 29%. Um, so, you know, not as bad uh, at a time when, when things are really tough. So, you know, as far as leading through a pandemic like this, you really go back to what, what are the principles that drive your business? Um, and for us at Choice, it's always been about our franchisees return on investment. Um, and that's something we've been doing for years. This is a company that's been around for 80 years. And a lot of that depends on how well do you know your customers, your, your franchisees? How connected are you with them? Um, and that really came to fruition in the worst days of this, back in late March, early April, into May. Um, it's relationships. It's talking to your franchisees. It's calling them up. It's sometimes it's offering them, you know, fee deferral or, or fee relief or, or whatever it might be. But other times it's just someone to talk to. Um, you know, they want to they want to know that their brand cares about what they're going through, understands it. Um, and is thinking about them, not just about how do I get through the next six months, but what's this going to look like three years from now? Um, you know, our franchisees are small business people. This isn't just an investment. It's their livelihood. So their, their family works at the hotel, their friends work at the hotel. Um, and so this is really about them being able to send their kids to college, being able to, you know, give their kids braces. Um, those are things that, that matter. And so it's that personal relationship that we as a company have built with our franchisees over the decades that really came to the forefront in the early days of this. And I think really helped us drive the performance we've seen. But also we do that by listening, listening to what our franchisees needs are and helping them really get through this. And as we all know, it's not over. Uh, we've, we've probably got another five to six months here to get to the other side when this vaccine will start to get deployed. So uh, all of that really comes into play as a leader is, is relying on those relationships uh, that you've built over the long term to, to help, you know, drive the company forward. What, what are you hearing at a granular level from that franchisee? Uh, are they able to just sort of barely break even? Are they paying debt service? Are they sort of laid everybody off and they're really rolling up sleeves with operations? What are you hearing at the, and how long can they continue that? Yeah, I think for the most part, I mean, I think you have to look at our, our brands, um, you know, of the, uh, of the 12 brands that we have, 
11 of them are limited service brands. Yeah. Um, so we don't have full service. We don't have meeting space that's significant of size. We don't have large restaurants. Um, we're not dependent on the convention business. Um, and so there's not a lot of fixed costs or there's less fixed costs, I guess you would say, in a limited service hotel than there is in a full service. Secondly, we've got franchisees who, you know, in the in later part of December, normally, you're running at fairly low occupancies anyway. This is a seasonal business. So our franchisees know how to operate in those types of environments, but they're not used to operating in that type of environment for six months, right? So um, luckily, they've been able to get interest forbearance for the most part um, for that first six months. I'm still hearing that, that now that we're seeing a vaccine timetable laying out, that, that more forbearance and, and getting that is still out there. Um, and it really depends on the market you're in. So if you're in an upscale segment like we are with Cambria, I mean, that's, that's a tough, tough segment. Um, on the other hand, the extended stay segment has done really well. Uh, our Woodspring brand has been running in the third quarter, they ran 77% occupancy. Um, so, you know, that, that's been a great segment to be in for, 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 for that brand. So it really depends on, on, on each, of the, uh, each of the brands and the segments that we're in, uh, where some are more challenged with making debt service and payroll and others are really, you know, and it looks more like a, a recession as opposed to this sort of deep demand shock that we've seen in other parts of the industry. So it sort of depends. Um, but by and large, we need more stimulus. We need more relief. Um, you know, it's very frustrating that everybody basically left the playing field back in early October and said, we're just going to wait to see what the outcome of the election is. Um, there's some green shoots, see, you know, a little bit of this bipartisanship starting to come together in the Senate um, to get some of the small business incentives done. Um, but we need that second draw of PPP loans. We need interest forbearance or uh, loan forgiveness rather for the $150,000 and less loans. Um, and we need liability protection for the hotels that have all of the protocols are, are doing all the right things from a safety perspective. Uh, we have to make sure that they are protected against frivolous lawsuits going forward. So more stimulus is needed and more relief is needed to get our industry really through the next probably five to six months when I think things will start to sort of turn for the uh, community better. No, I love this. You answered all my questions because I was going to ask how long do you think we need? Think five months. What, uh, and then what? You know, I, I look at it this way, Teague. We're, you know, we're nine months in, right? I mean, I've, I've, I've been talking to my team about, is this a marathon or a sprint? And if it's a marathon, I don't know what milepost I'm at, right? <laughs> uh, and none of us do. And I think, I think the, the, the news we've gotten in the last three weeks around the vaccine and the timetable, um, you know, it's a three-week FDA approval process. And the first two are going into that. So by the end of December, you can actually start deploying the vaccine and it'll go to the high risk people, it'll go to the frontline responders. Um, and so if you look at that timetable, you could actually have immunity by the summertime, um, which is really important for our, for our business. And um, you know, I think as you get closer and closer to that, so I kind of look at it and say, well, I'm nine months in, I got seven months to go. Um, so I'm, I'm beyond the halfway point. Um, and, and, and that's how we're, we're trying to think about it from the standpoint of how much more relief, what's, what, what are our franchisees going to be going through in the next six months? Um, it's going to be another, you know, we can see the end of the tunnel and it is starting to get closer than, 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 than the beginning of it. And so I'm, I'm feeling more optimistic now, now that we're, we've gotten this sort of recent vaccine. News. What do you, what do you think? Like now I'm going to get into your opinion. What do you think come fall, right? Is the world immediately back to normal? Or is there still sort of a hangover factor where everybody's not rushing to get out there? What do you, what's your opinion? Well, I, my opinion has been, I think, if you look at all the investments companies have made in all of this virtual work from home technology, I can't imagine that CFOs are gonna look at their 2020 travel budgets. And I'm not talking about the hotel industry, I'm talking about corporate business travel and say, okay, everybody go back to what you were doing. I think the pandemic is gonna change some of the, the behaviors that we see on the consumer side and for leisure travel, and we're gonna see some changes on, on, on business travel. Um, you know, my prediction is, you know, I, I, Bill Gates was, was on a couple of weeks ago saying 50% of business travel will disappear. I don't believe that. Um, it, it benefits Bill Gates to say that because he owns Microsoft Teams, right? So <laughs> he, he would love to see that happen. Um, but I'm more of a mindset that when it does come back, I don't think it's gonna come back in the, in the full way that it did in 2019. Now, on the, on the other hand, the economy is going to grow. So, you know, and this is a, you know, the U.S. is a great, great market. 
there's going to be a larger population, more business activity. So, so business travel will continue to grow. Um, but I think there's going to be more virtual meetings. I think there's all this infrastructure that's been built. And I think some people have gotten used to it and saying, hey, I can close software as a service deal without getting on the road, going, seeing a customer. Um, so I do think we're going to see a little bit of a, uh, at the margins, less business travel than we've seen. And then I think in our business, you know, the leisure travel side of the house, you're, you're going to see more flexibility. If people can, you know, not go into the office five days a week, but can work virtually one or two of those days, they're going to have more options to travel and travel at different times of the year when destinations aren't as crowded. And, and, and so I do think you're, you're, you're going to see the calendar shift a little bit where a lot of that peak summer travel will probably start to show up earlier in the spring and later in the fall. Um, and those are trends we've actually been seeing before the pandemic hit. So I do think you're going to see more of that flexibility in people's ability to travel. And I think that's going to be net positive uh, for the industry, particularly for, for, for the leisure travel sector. What, uh, that's, this is fascinating. Talk to me about, let's pick on choice. Let me get a little personal, but one, talk about furloughs, you laid people off. When do you think you'll bring those people back at what levels? And then talk about third quarter versus first, fourth quarter versus what you see in first and second quarter. Sure. So what we had to do back in, uh, in the April, May timeframe, uh, is we, we, like everybody else had to had to reduce our costs. So, right. uh, we initially did furloughs, but most of those furloughs ended up being permanent. Um, and we, we made that decision early on, uh, back on the 1st of July. So there's no more furloughs or, or, or additional layoffs that we're considering at this point. Um, and that was tough. It was tough to go through that. Uh, we lost about, uh, about 200 of our uh, associates as part of it. And most of those are people who were focused on demand driven type activities, room sales, um, you know, th those types of things. It's just that the volumes go down. There's just not work for them to do. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're sort of, Beyond that, we, we essentially did that with the mindset of we need the right workforce to get us through 2021 and not just get us through 2020. So we were really thinking long term when we made those uh, additional uh, or initial cuts on, on our workforce. Um, you know, I think that's that's really what we wanted to do. And, and our, our business model, because it's a scale model, um, allows us to sort of flex that up and flex it down. Um, we did not touch the, the folks who are franchisee facing. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we had people out driving business to our hotels. We were the only company actually out there in the month of June doing a, an, ad, an ad campaign um, because we wanted to drive uh, business into our hotels. And despite what you read in the paper, there were a lot of people out traveling over the summer. Um, and that's when our hotels expect to make money. So we wanted to make sure we were capturing that demand. And I think we, uh, when you look at our Red Park index numbers, how the company did in the second and third quarter, we captured an outsized share of demand. Um, you know, we, for all but one of our brands, that full service brand, uh, we saw significant rep par index increases um, in the second and third quarter. And so that's really where we've been focused is, yeah, there's demand out there. It's not what it used to be, but we need to make sure we're out there capturing it uh, and driving that business into our hotels. Uh, good for you guys, by the way. Congratulations. All right. So talk to me about sort of the future, the development, the conversions, and, and even just simple transfers. What do you see in there? So we're actually seeing, um, you know, we're seeing business, we're seeing, we're seeing deals happen. Um, significantly, it's shifting more towards conversion deals. Um, if you look at our third quarter numbers, about 70% of what uh, David Pepper's team um, did on the uh, contract awards were, were for conversions. Um, that's typically what happens when you get into a downturn. If you dial the clock back 10 years ago and you look at our performance and how we did from a development perspective, um, we did more conversions. And if you look at our brand portfolio, uh, we have new brands today we didn't have 10 years ago, um, particularly the Ascend collection, uh, which has been just a really outstanding performer uh, for us. And not just in the pandemic, but, but, but prior to that. So we have about 300 Ascends now. Uh, we were the first hotel company to uh, launch a soft brand. It's now been copied by many. Um, but it's really been a success for us from the standpoint of getting those independent boutique historic hotels um, that want the loyalty program, the distribution, the training, the revenue management uh, opportunities, all those things you can get by being part of a 7,000 uh, hotel chain um, that you can't get if you're an independent operator. So, so the Ascend collection I expect will do quite well going forward. We launched Clarion Point about two years ago, so it gives us another conversion brand opportunity. We didn't have that brand uh, 10 years ago. 
Um, and then our extended stay segment um, has uh, two conversion brands in it, Mainstay and, uh, and Suburban. Um, and we've seen conversion opportunities pick up for both of those brands as well. Uh, so I do think it's going to be more of a conversion type hotel transaction environment as we move forward. Um, you know, right now, people are, are, are still transacting. They're still relicensing hotels. Um, it's certainly not at the volume that, uh, that we were used to. Uh, but I do think, as you said, Teague, this is going to be more of a conversion game um, as hotel financing is, is not there for new construction projects. What, what do you predict, uh, knowing what you've learned in the last nine months, what do you think will be your best growth brand moving forward? And, it, and well, I think, Yeah, I think it's, I mentioned two of them. I mentioned yeah. the Sen and I mentioned all, all of our extended stay hotels. I agree. Um, the other one I'll mention is Comfort Inn. Um, you know, one of the things that we were very fortunate is we completely refreshed that brand and finished that right at the end of 2019. So we exited some poor performers from the brand back five years ago. We rebuilt our pipeline, and then we refreshed the existing core of that brand. Um, so Comfort Inn is back in, in a growth mode as well. And that's a brand that we do usually about two-thirds new construction, about one-third conversion. Um, but the performance numbers for Comfort have been really positive from a RevPAR index perspective, both prior to the pandemic and actually during it as well. So I think in addition to Ascend, our Cambria brand and the upscale segment, Comfort Inn is going to be a real driver for us and then the extended stay brands as well. So those, those, those four or five brands in particular, I think are ones that we're gonna see a lot of growth here, even, even as the industry starts to recover. Uh, I think that's all super. So let's talk about one, you guys are healthy on your balance sheets. Uh, you got a ton of you know, liquidity out there, I don't know, 800 million if you need it. Uh, how are you gonna use that liquidity to stay afloat, but also to grow? Yeah, so we, uh, you know, as a company, we've always been sort of prudent allocators of capital. We came into this pandemic, we didn't have a high debt load on the company, um, and that really helps us from the standpoint of liquidity. Um, like everybody else, we went out and sort of said, look, interest rates are ridiculously low. Uh, we did a bond offering back in July. Um, the day we did, we priced it was actually the ninth lowest day in the last 50 years uh, for, for Treasury. So we really hit it at the right time. Um, and it really gives us an opportunity to sort of um, expand our, our balance sheet capacity. Uh, you mentioned we have nearly 800 million of uh, liquidity. Uh, some of that's in cash, some of that's in our, in our revolver, uh, but it gives us the opportunity to do the things we've always done. And it's not a new strategy. We're gonna invest in our business. We're gonna invest in our brands. Um, we're gonna launch a brand um, uh, called Everhome, which we announced in, um, in uh, January. Um, when hotel financing comes back, we think it's a great sector. Uh, we have mid-scale expertise and we have extended stay expertise. And so that having a new mid-scale extended stay brand, you know, one hasn't been launched in the last 10 years. Um, and when you look at the demand and supply, there's a lot of extended stay demand out there, but there's not much extended stay supply. Uh, and so we really think the supply and demand metrics set up nicely for, for that brand as well. So we'll use it for that. Um, we always are looking for M&A activity, uh, you know, for, for opportunities that come along. Uh, we've got a great uh, platform business that uh, we think if we were to add a brand or two here, there, it might make sense. Um, so we'll continue to look at that. And then there's always the option of returning it to shareholders if it made sense to do that. If we don't find other opportunities for us to deploy that cap. Uh, great. I've, uh, I've got a few brands I'd like you to consider. We'll talk <laughs> offline. <laughs> uh, all right. So this is great. So I agree. I think you guys are, are, are well positioned. I think the nice part is that we see uh, to your point earlier, we, we kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. We now have a little bit of clarity over what much time frame we have left. So we can kind of start shifting from offense, from defense now to offense, right? So give yeah. me, what do you think the next 12 months or 24 months looks like, looks like for choice? Yeah, I think the, the first six months of next year are going to be, you know, we're going to be in this sort of recovery phase um, where I think it's really going to be a question of when does, the, when does the business traveler start to come back? Um, and, and what's been interesting about the leisure traveler is that that leisure traveler has been there. Um, despite rising cases, we've seen, we've seen leisure travel continue. Um, and so I think that that first six months is going to be a little bit of a wait and see. Um, the real question is, when is the financial community going to start to say, okay, now I can start to underwrite a loan or I can start to underwrite a future, you know, new construction asset. Um, you know, once you get more clarity on, okay, are things really starting to pick back up again? Is the consumer coming back? Um, I mean, this is different than the last recession. The last recession was a financial crisis. This is a health crisis. 
So a lot of this is what's the consumer going to do? How comfortable is the consumer going to be in getting back out there and traveling? Um, and when I talk to my, you know, my, my, my counterparts at the other hotel companies, I mean, this was, this is not some man-made disaster, right? It was, a, it was a natural disaster, right? So not something you plan for. Um, and so a lot of this is going to be, well, when do the consumers start to become more confident in getting back out there and traveling again? And when that happens, then the financial community, as far as lending, will come back. But, but I see that happening. It's all tied to this vaccine deployment. Um, and, and I really think that's really going to be, given the timetable we're looking at, um, you're going to start to see that in the, in the back half of next year. So I think that's a real positive uh, for our industry. And I think that's really going to be, it's going to be kind of a tale of two cities. The first half is going to be more of a wait and see. And I think we're going to be back more to, uh, okay, now I see. And here's, here's where I'm going to start to deploy my, uh, my capital. But you know, T, it's interesting. I, I look at the, you go back and look 10 years ago. You know what business got created 10 years ago? In the last recession, what? Airbnb. Oh yeah. And they just filed two weeks ago for a thirty billion dollar IPO, right? So during downturns, this is when new opportunities and new ideas and new business models all get created. And so that's that's the other thing that some some new ways of doing business are going to come out of this. You know, ten years ago we created the soft brand, right? Look at how many soft brands there are today. So I think I think we'd be foolish to say there aren't going to be some new things that come out of this that I think will create value. And so I think that's something else for us all to be thinking about is how do we, you know, sort of cast off the old ways of the past and think about what, what makes sense going forward. Uh, what, did, what did we not like about how the hotel industry worked, ten, you know, five years ago or three years ago or, or nine months ago? Um, and let's not carry that with us going forward. Let's, let's figure out a new way of doing business um, and in a way that creates value for everyone. Do you think we as an industry will, will adapt collectively? Do you think we'll be quick to adapt or do you think we'll be very slow to adapt? To whatever I think, the nuance is. I think we're going to be quick to adapt. I think there's, there's been a lot of things that were accelerated as part of this. Yep. Um, certainly the shift of everything being digital and online and all that. I mean, we figured out how to open hotels without sending somebody out there. You can do it in a, uh, in a, uh, in a virtual environment. Um, we figured out how to do deals without getting face-to-face. -face. We're going to be face-to-face -face again, don't get me wrong, uh, but we figured out how to do that. So I think there's um, you know, there's going to be an acceleration on a lot of these things. I mean, what's happening in our segments, you know, we've, we've done away with the hot breakfast and the buffet breakfast as a result of the pandemic. The real question is, do you bring that back, right? I mean, it drives cost, right? So we're going to be very sort of, you know, careful as to what we think about uh, as far as adding cost back in. If the guest doesn't need it, why do we do it? We were already before the pandemic doing housekeeping on request, meaning if you don't want your room turned every night, um, tell us that we won't send a housekeeper in every, every, you know, every day. Um, we've done the pilot testing on that. Most consumers opt out of that. Well, okay. That's great now for the hotel owner when we don't have to pay for that room to be turned. It's good for the environment. We're not doing all that laundry and, and using all those cleaning chemicals. So there's some of these things I think that are going to get accelerated, which are going to be a net positive for, for the asset owners. And, and I think you, you said at the beginning of this conversation, it, you're in communication, direct communication with your franchisees. And I think your franchisees more than any others are on the ground and know what's happening day to day. So they can give you the real time feedback as well. Hey, here's what the guests want. Here's what's working from us from a ownership standpoint. Here's what in a franchisee standpoint. And I think that will help you guys react better. Don't you agree? Yeah, and I think what's interesting is it's not going to be a one size fits all. It's about flexibility. And, and so flexibility versus brand standards, those two things don't go together normally, right? It's like, oh, it's one standard. Well, I think the industry is gonna have to be more flexible. And in a market where a hot breakfast buffet makes sense, we wanna allow our franchisees to do that. But if a grab and go you know, uh, sandwich or uh, you know, heat it up in the microwave sandwich is what the market wants and the consumer in that market wants, and we need to be thinking about providing that flexibility for those, for those owners and those guests. I, I think you nail on the head, Pat. I think you guys will be spot on. All right, I love it. So give me, um, Pat, this is fantastic. Thank you for coming on. Um, you're, give me some final thoughts. Even, heck, you're in D.C., you're on the top of it. What are you hearing from your friends and neighbors and the like, whether it's vaccine-related or political-related or just getting back to business-related? What are you hearing? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I've got, I've got, I've got friends who work over at NIH, so we were, you know, we've been sort of keeping in touch with them on, they're the ones that approve the vaccines and the therapeutics and all that. Um, and it's kind of interesting because they've, they've been aware of what's truly gone on in the last nine months since this thing began globally um, and, 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 and in our businesses. 
particularly in the, in the healthcare sector, is, is unprecedented. I mean, the government stepped in and said, all these, all these um, pharmaceutical companies, share your information. Um, forget about antitrust rules and all that. Share your information. We're all going to benefit from this. And then we did that globally. So, you know, the Chinese and the Saudis worked together. U.S. and Western Europe worked together. So this sort of coming together of the world and, and, and our, our industries uh, to drive this vaccine is, is a real net positive. You think about, I mean, when this thing started, people said, well, vaccines can take three to five years. Well, if a vaccine took nine months, what else can we do if we all just work together in a, in a more collaborative fashion and, and stop trying to you know, bifurcate everything and divide everything? So uh, I would hope that this you know, pandemic that we go through as a, as a country, we can all look at that, the less, lessons learned and say, geez, if we all just share a little bit more information, everybody's better off. I think on the political front, we're going to be back to the same things we were talking about prior to the pandemic. It's going to be labor issues. It's going to be taxes, right? I mean, those are the two drivers for, for asset owners uh, that matter. Um, in the franchise world, we're going to be back talking about joint employer issues. Um, and so those, those issues are all going to happen. And it's not all going to happen here at the uh, federal level. It's going to happen in the state capitals. Um, you know, we're a member now of AHNLA this year. Uh, what I really like about what CHIP is doing and what we work with our friends at AHOA on is they're doing a lot of work at the state capital level because that's where a lot of these changes start. If you look at what's going on in California, those changes, if they're anti-business or anti-franchising, they tend to start in, in, in states like that and then they start to spread across the country. So business people need to be engaged. We've got to be more engaged in, on our, with, our, with our politicians uh, to keep them educated about what drives business, what drives the employment. Um, of, of the workforce um, and make sure that we're keeping the politicians aware of what matters to us as an industry. I mean, uh, Pat, I love it. It's, I feel like I'm talking to Chip or Brian again right now from HLA. Uh, and, and listen, you're a leader, and I appreciate you speaking for all the, your franchisees, sort of the smaller voices out there. Uh, they're smart enough, they know through AHOA, through HLA, they can grow up and, and become a very powerful voice uh, if and when they choose. But we need the leaders, you and Chip and the others, to tell us what's important and what's coming down our path and where we need to focus our energies. So thank you for everything you're doing. I think it's fantastic. Um, Pat, thanks for coming. I should ask, obviously, I'll see you in March. Uh, you think we're having a conference in March? You think everybody will be showing up in person? I should be asking you that question, right? We're, we're always waiting. I mean, look, I, I, and I've said this, I've said this to, to the folks at Alice and the folks at NYU, we all want to get back together. This is a people business, right? Um, and I think it's just a question of, is everybody going to feel comfortable being in a big room? Um, and then, as you know, we're all dependent on what the states allow us to do. So um, you've, got to, you've got a plan. You know, we do a big convention every year. We've got a plan. Um, but, but I think everybody's in a wait and see on therapeutics and vaccines and ultimately these state restrictions as to whether or not we can all get together. I know there's demand. Uh, I went to a hotel opening back in September in Gainesville, Florida. And uh, we had four or five other franchisees who came to that hotel opening just to see us. Uh, you know, they got in the car and drove three hours. And so uh, it was great to see people again. And so I know there's this demand out there to sort of get and this, this weird Zoom environment is, we've all become used to it, but, but it's not reality. Uh, we all wanna get back to being, uh, you know, in a face-to-face in a, in a -to -face engagement. So I hope we're able to do it in, uh, in March. Um, if we are, we'll be there, but, uh, you know, we'll wait and see, I guess, as, as we get through this next kind of six month window here and see what happens. We are, I appreciate the support. We are feeling that overwhelming demand that you mentioned. Everyone is like, please, please, please. So we are bound and determined to do it. We are having to get more political working with our local leaders to make sure that we can, in fact, do it. Uh, but uh, I don't know, time will tell. We're, yeah. we're fighting real hard right now. So, Pat, thank you. You're a true friend. I appreciate you coming on. Uh, best everything you're doing at Choice. Uh, and your teams, and uh, let's stay focused. We'll get through it. Great, thanks, Teague. Have a happy holiday. You too, Pat. 11, 11 family members. <laughs>